You're listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, with service members from across the military, sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Joining us now on the Hazard Ground Podcast, he is Air Force Colonel Retired Roland Guidry. He served in Vietnam, and most notably, he was part of one of the more spectacular military failures as it's been labeled in trying to help get the Iran hostage crisis solved. But the benefit of that is that it turned out to be one of the more beneficial things for the military in developing special operations. And it's Colonel Guidry, Roland Guidry, joining us on the Hazard Ground podcast. Colonel, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. My pleasure. All right, sir. So tell us, how did you get your start in the military? Well, I grew up in South Louisiana, Cajun country, and um, educated by nuns and very little vocational guidance. But I had a first cousin that uh, went into the Air Force, and that sounded good enough for me. So he was sort of my role model when I was growing up. And I went to college uh, at University of Louisiana Lafayette, Raging Cajuns, got an electrical engineering degree, went through ROTC, and then uh, went to pilot training after that, uh, and then graduated from pilot training in 1962, just about the same time as the Cuban Missile Crisis, and um, selected the C-130 Hercules as my aircraft and um, have flown various models of the C-130 throughout my career of 26 years. And that's interesting because you, you are actually are the, to this point, the oldest person we've had on the podcast as far as serving in Vietnam and, and things of that nature. You'd be our first Vietnam veteran that we've had on the podcast. And I guess my question is, what was the cultural climate like back then? Like, we know what it was prior to 9-11. It was a very robust America, and then all of a sudden it happened, and everything changed. We know why people signed up after 9-11. But for you, what was it like joining the military at that point in time? Were a lot of people doing it? How did that go? Well, the Korean War had ended, and um, we were in relatively peacetime scenario at that point, and uh, a lot of opportunity for people going to college and selecting whatever career field they wanted. Um, as it turned out, the Air Force needed pilots, um, and I went to Lubbock, Texas, Reese Air Force Base, and uh, as it turned out, we actually graduated more students than we started with because we had washbacks from other classes ahead of us. So um, it was a very ideal time to enter the military and sort of choose the career path you wanted to. I always knew I wanted to fly. And the Air Force sent me to uh, flight training while I was in college to get the basics of uh, how to fly an airplane. So that really gave me a boost. And the C-130, of course, had been developed um, right after the World War II by Lockheed. And what's ironic about the airplane is that the assembly line started in 1954 in Marietta, Georgia, and has never shut down. So it's been probably the most successful airplane the Air Force ever bought. It's been modified to do crazy things, and I did a lot of those crazy things myself. Well, I mean, the, the craziness, obviously, in, in flying one of those, and for those listening to C-130, it, it's your standard four-wing propeller, kind of the one that you see transport plane that you'd see over any kind of military base or any Air Force base. I mean, it, it was developed, as you said, you know, for those transport purposes, but has been used for so many different things since its inception. So I wonder, when you decided that you wanted to be a pilot, did, did you have any particular interest in any given plane or were you just wanting to be in the air? I mean, what, were you, what was your thoughts then? Well, I really didn't have any preconceived ideas about how well I would come out in the class. In, in those days, class standing lets you select the, the assignments. So if you had 50 graduates in a class, then the Air Force sent 50 assignments and number one had his pick of the litter on down. I was about midway in my class and it was a time when uh, the Air Force was uh, changing uh, the jet airplane that, that pilots flew in pilot training to the T-38. And Reese Air Force Base, where I was stationed, didn't really get any T-38. So we got mainly multi-engine assignments. And 
as it turned out, the squadron that I went to was just down the road at Dias Air Force Base, and it was the model of the C-130 that was on skis. So my first five years flying the C-130 was in the Arctic, Alaska, Greenland, northern Canada, supporting radar sites on the Greenland ice cap and radar sites in Alaska. And it's a very forgiving airplane, and uh, it, it probably suited my personality rather than the typical gung-ho fighter pilot type person. So as you get to starting to pilot and you're flying around, what's the world climate at this point in time? I know you said it was 1962, just prior to the Cuban Missile Crisis. How quickly are things escalating? Well, Vietnam had not reared its ugly head yet. That started around 1964. So it was relatively a peacetime environment and um, not too much emphasis on the military. No wars going on, so it was sort of like any other profession that um, you did your best to excel. And the mid-60s, of course, was when the Vietnam War started. And the C-130, of course, is a propeller airplane, which has a lot of advantages in making short field takeoffs and and getting into um, small airfields uh, with reversing props and that kind of stuff. So there's always a place for a propeller airplane um, to do those things in a remote area. So I flew the C-130 ski model for five years, and then uh, that was two years in Texas and three years in Alaska. And because I had five years' experience in the C-130, when it got time for me to be reassigned from Alaska, I got this kind of strange assignment to Tucson, Arizona, and what what basically happened is that um, the U-2 that got shot down over Russia in May of 1960 and the U-2 that got shot down during the missile crisis in Cuba resulted in the Air Force uh, saying, gee, we better use some other method to get photographic reconnaissance. So they came up with the idea of drones. And a uh, few people don't realize that we launched 3,400 drones uh, during the period mid '60s to, to mid '70s throughout the Vietnam War, so that's how I did my Southeast Asia. We basically uh, had drones slung under the wing of a C-130, and we would uh, take off uh, from Benoit normally in South Vietnam, and clandestinely fly up uh, and get as close as we could to um, the northern Gulf of Tonkin off the Haiphong Harbor, and pop up all of a sudden along to drone. And we would get the drone back because in those days, we had to retrieve the film to process it to get the intelligence. Now, of course, drones are much more advanced and (laughs) they send the intelligence back immediately. But in those days, we had to retrieve the drone. So the outfit was a top secret unit for four years. That's what I did in Southeast Asia, launching drones. Um, I was in... I was stationed in Tucson, Arizona, but I would go ten, uh, on, on temporary duty to Vietnam uh, for about seven days at a time. So I had about five or six of, of those deployments where I would um, fly maybe 30 or 40 missions in my 70 days that I was there. And we always knew that uh, it was a very hazardous mission because uh, we were very vulnerable in the northern Gulf of Tonkin from uh, MiG-21 doing a supersonic dash and getting us. So, um, but we never did have any airplanes lost. So it was, it was a very successful operation. Um, Of course, satellites came along after that and Uh kind of put that out of business. Yeah. um, In those days we had to rely on photographic intelligence. And that was one of the primary ones in Vietnam because what people don't realize is that the Russians spent so much effort and time making the defenses around Hanoi so strong that our normal reconnaissance airplanes couldn't operate in that environment. They'd get shot down. So the only two real reconnaissance programs we had that could survive and take photographic intelligence were low-altitude drones, which I was involved with, and very, very high, fast, um, three times the speed of sound supersonic airplane called the SR-71. So those were the only platforms that could uh, could survive in that environment, and that's how I did my Southeast Asia. 
I mean, and that's just incredible to me because for the history majors out there, you know, the U-2 spy plane was one of those things that was supposed to be untouchable, correct? I mean, it flew so high that you couldn't shoot it down. And when... Well... Go ahead. Yes, that that's correct until May of 1960 when the Russians developed the SA-2 uh, surface-to-air missile, and uh, that's what shot down the U-2. So we lost two of them uh, in the early 60s. So the U-2 is still operating now, but it, it's limited to certain areas where the defenses are not as robust as uh, as the Russians built it around Hanoi. And so let me just clarify for you, Colonel, in reference to your drone missions, because so basically you're saying you would have a drone attached to the wing of your aircraft and you would release it over the area or close to the area that you wanted to surveil. And was somebody controlling it from the ground then or you guys were controlling it from inside the plane? Well, the best way to answer your question is now, of course, satellites are so sophisticated that the drones are, are self-programmed, but they can be controlled by somebody half a world away right. now. But in those days, we had to have line of sight. So you had to have a clear path between the launch airplane and the drone to control it. So we would sneak up the Gulf of Tonkin at about 300 feet above the water and pop up all of a sudden. And then we'd launch the drone normally from 3,000 feet maybe 20 miles off the coast, because if we got any closer than 20 miles off the coast of uh, North Vietnam, then we were within the lethal surface-to-air missile ring. So we had to launch and then break immediately. And the drone was self-programmed to navigate on its own, not very accurately, but it did on its own. So it was it was click off every, every mile travel, it would click off, and then you would program events on on the mile in question. So it might come off the wing of the 130 and then immediately go down to 500 feet above the ground and then go feet dry or over land. And then a, a climb command might be, might be programmed for mile, let's say 30. And then a left turn might be programmed for mile 37 and then camera on at mile 42 and whatever. So it was programmed to go in, take pictures and then come out. And it was programmed to, fly very high to save fuel once it came off uh, the coast of uh, North Vietnam. And it was programmed to go on its own and enter an orbit off the coast of Da Nang, um, the northern part of South Vietnam, where two helicopters would be waiting. And then the drone by that time would be around 55,000 feet and we would command it or the ground site could command it either one for the recovery mode, which means the fuel would be dumped, the engine would be stopped, and it would come down in a stabilization parachute. And then at 15,000 feet, a very large chute would open barometrically. And then the helicopters would catch sight of it by that time and set up an orbit. And then they would snag a, a cable loop at the top of the, the parachute and reel it in. And the parachute would just drop into the gulf and sink. And they would then land at Da Nang. The film would be put on a very fast airplane, and and it would be taken to Saigon for processing. I, I mean, that's just uh, – it's crazy because, as you said, like today this happens instantaneously. Like you flip a button on, and you're looking live at pictures on some other side of the world. But this almost seems to me, when I think about it, like how many moving parts were there all together with this whole thing that, oh, my God, the, the, the fail rate seems like almost – like it happened a lot. Like, did you how many did you did you lose a lot of these drones or no? Yeah, we did. Um, typically, we would have one under each wing, and if if that day we were flying one mission, then both drones were programmed for the same route, and then we would try to determine which drone seemed to be the most accurate and launch that one. If we had uh, two missions, then we had to have enough time between mission one and mission two for the helicopters to cycle that would catch the drone. So we would program the left and the right drone for different missions, and we'd launch the first one, and then we'd have to orbit in the northern Gulf of Tonkin uh, to let the helicopters catch the first one and recycle, et cetera, and then we'd launch the second one maybe three hours later. Typically, um, drones would either get shot down on its, first, on, the, on its very first mission or sometimes, the, I think the record was 64 missions where one drone actually six, flew 64 times before uh, it didn't come back. Wow. And the, the enemy would, even, would sometimes get them with AAA or anti-aircraft artillery. Sometimes they would kill them with MiGs. 
chasing him and, and firing a missile at him. And mechanical problems also occur at some time. So uh, it was a mixture of how the enemy got them. Of course, we, we did everything possible to not give them advance warning. So when we took off out of Benoit, normally at about 4 in the morning, so that nobody would see the airplanes with the drones hanging there, uh, we'd get a green light from the tower. We would make zero radio calls. And then we would uh, blend into normal C-130 traffic in South Vietnam and enter the traffic pattern at Da Nang which is in the northern part of South Vietnam. And then on downwind leg, we peel off and go down right over the water at about 300 feet. Now, this is way before GPS and that fancy stuff, as you realize. <laughs> and then we would tool up for an hour and a half up the Gulf of Tonkin to make a, an actual launch time, launch point time to coordinate with the helicopters. And um, it was a very interesting mission because it was total radio silent. And... Um, one of the most interesting things about it is that we were never told what our targets were, or after we flew a mission, we were never told if we obtained valuable intelligence. Why was that? The reason for that was that if we got shot down on a subsequent mission, sure. then we would not have that information in our head. Probably the most interesting time was when there was an effort to try to rescue some POWs at a POW camp called Sante, S-O-N-T-A-Y. And the presence of the POWs in that POW camp had been discovered by drones. There were probably a dozen POW compounds in North Vietnam, and we would regularly fly drones over them for several reasons. One was the morale of the POWs, to know that somebody was still thinking about them. And they finally put two and two together and said, hey, the drone's coming over maybe every, every third or fourth day. Why don't we try to send signals back home? So they had a lot of time to think about what to do. So they would do different things to try to send a signal to us. Like, for instance, uh, they would walk around and, and stamp in the sand um, letters or something. Uh, they would hang their clothes on the laundry in a, in a certain pattern that might indicate who they were. And um, they just did a lot of things, and by the time the, the raid on the camp at Sante was conducted in November of 1970, we knew exactly which POWs were in that in that uh, POW compound. Wow, As it that's unreal. Out, wow. Yeah, the book on, the, on that mission is called The Raid by Benjamin Schemmer. Very interesting read. Um, as it turned out, the, the, the camp had been emptied. And there, was, there were no POWs there. But the mission was very successful from an operational standpoint. And like anything else, sometimes you have unintended consequences in this world. What basically happened is the North Vietnamese realized that we had come in. I was not, in, I was not involved in the actual raid, just the intelligence gathering. Um, the North Vietnamese realized that uh, we could come in at night, in the dead of night, land, crash land a helicopter right in the middle of their compound, and do a very successful mission and get out with them, without them knowing about it or having any impact on preventing it. So what they did basically is they said, okay, after Sante, they closed most of the outlying camps and moved all of the POWs into the camps in downtown Hanoi, the most notably the Hanoi Hilton. Right. And that was probably the best thing that could have happened to the POWs because before that time, with, with a dozen or so camps, the POWs were kept in solitary confinement and had low morale and no camp organization or whatever. So after the Sante raid of November 1970, they were all moved into two or three camps in, in downtown Hanoi, the most heavily defended area. And now they were crowded two or three to a cell, and that's probably the best thing that could have happened to them because they got organized, they had a, another GI to speak to, and they developed something called the TAP code. I'm not sure you're familiar with it. I, I am familiar with it. I remember reading Leo Thornis's book, and he talked about that, the TAP code. Yeah, they, they banged on pipes all night. And, of course, the, the TAP code is based on the fact that the uh, alphabet you and I are familiar with is 26 characters. But C and K are redundant. So if you eliminate K and you substitute C whenever you need a K, then you have a perfect grid five by five. Mm-hmm. So the reason the TAP code works better in this situation where you're banging on pipes or whatever 
rather than Morse code is that Morse code depends on dots and dashes, whereas the tap code depends only on a sequence of taps. So like you would go two down and three across or whatever to get a certain letter. So it would be like tap, 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 tap. That would be the first letter and then a pause, etc. So they used the tap code all night banging on the pipes and the North Vietnamese guards never figured out what they were doing. So they, they, they would talk to each other, they would console each other, they would hold prayer sessions, they would um, just communicate and their morale went sky high. The camp organization um, got organized very well. So the bottom line is we didn't rescue the, the 50 or so POWs at Sante, but the raid on the POW compound benefited all of the POWs, and I've, I've gone to their reunions since that, and they've, they've credited the the Sante raid and the drones with keeping them mentally um, alert throughout their captivity. That's just, that's amazing. It's just, uh, it's so hard to comprehend because we have so much technology nowadays that, you, you know, just to think on that level, I don't think a lot of people um, maybe who may be listening to this podcast would ever think that way. Let me ask you, when you said that's how you spent your time in, in Southeast Asia, I mean, that was your entire... Vietnam War experience was flying the drones and doing stuff like that? Yes. Over a four-year period, 67 to 71, then I went over 70 days at a time, I think five times. And uh, otherwise, I was stationed in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, so the squadron had what was called temporary duty in Vietnam, and that's that's how I spent my Southeast Asia. And the Air Force said, okay, you're at the 10 year point in your career and you have an engineering degree we want you to go get a master's in engineering so that's what i did the next two years and then um, i graduated with a master's in astronautics and by that time the air force had no more space programs nasa had them all so the air force said we don't know what the hell to do with you so i said just send me to eglin air force base in the panhandle of florida so i was in research and development for special operations um, for about seven years managing projects uh, to develop tactics and procedures for special ops. Probably the most fun project I ever did was um, had to do with SEAL Team 2. Uh, the British had been dropping uh, Zodiacs with a, a team of uh, commandos right behind them from C-130s, but the Air Force hadn't done it yet. And uh, SEAL Team 2 knocked on my door one time and said, uh, Major Guidry, we'd like you to develop a project for us where we can drop a Zodiac or Gemini, one of the rubber rating craft, with a, a team of six SEALs that go out right behind it. And that's probably the most fun project that I did with SEAL Team 2. So I, I kind of got my name known around the, the special ops community when I ran that project. So when I finished my seven years of research and development, it was time to go back to the cockpit and in the panhandle of Florida, we have Eglin Air Force Base, and we have the, the mecca of special operations called Hurlburt Field, part of the Eglin Reservation right down the street. So I came out on the squadron commander's list, and I got command of the 8th Special Operations Squadron in May of 1979. And, of course, the embassy fell um, in November of 79, so I was the commander of the squadron that uh, was selected to uh, take part in the uh, project of the Eagle Call. Yeah, and you, you fast forward a lot there, and I do want to get the Eagle Claw. Let me just ask you one more question in reference to your flying experience in Vietnam. How much did you deal with, like, contact with the enemy in the air? Not, nothing at all, really. Really? Uh, wow, okay. We had F-4s um, flying what is called bar cap. Um, there was a picket ship in the northern Gulf of Tonkin, code name was Red Crown. And whenever we flew up north, then uh, there would be F-4s from a carrier probably that would be uh, airborne uh, circling in the northern Gulf of Tonkin without divulging where we were below them. So uh, we, would get, we would get calls all the time from Red Crown that the, the bad guys had launched a MiG, whether it, they were trying to get us to break our mission off or trying to kill the drone we never knew but we would we would hear all the time red crown's warnings that uh, a mig has been launched from one of the mig bases and was heading our way and but we knew we had bar cap above us the, the air force covering us so we never really had contact with the enemy 
we were just it was a very clean Vietnam job. What I mean by that is that uh, we, we flew long missions. We we had high priority. All our missions were top secret, and um, we we knew we had a very important job to gather intelligence. And probably the most the most beneficial use of the drones had to do with with the events that at the end of the Vietnam War. It was Project Linebacker Two in the fall of 1972. Um, there was this thing in the Air Force uh, called BDA, Bomb Damage Assessment. Mm -hmm. What that basically means is you send B-52s or whatever to, to bomb airfields or make air for, air, airfields auto commission or whatever you want to do, and you may not know the success of that. So if, if you don't know what, whether you were successful, then you may have to send the same airplanes the next day. So Linebacker 2 was conducted in the fall of 1972 during the monsoon season so therefore the SR-71 is flying at 80,000 feet three times the speed of sound taking pictures were ineffective because of the cloud cover so the only the only weapon system we had to determine whether six missions that were launched by B-52s were successful were drones so the B-52s would come over and that's what that's what brought them to the bargaining table, by the way, and that ended basically the, the U.S. involvement in, in the war. But they would fly a mission, and then not knowing whether it was successful, we'd launch a drone right right behind them to determine whether tomorrow you needed to do it again or whether you had been successful in day one. And that, that in itself probably saved a lot of lives on airplanes because you didn't have to put them at risk the next day if – bomb damage assessment coverage showed that their mission on day one was successful. Incredible stuff. Uh, so let's fast forward back to Operation Eagle Claw, which, again, for those of the younger audience here listening, uh, the Iran hostage crisis, the U.S. Embassy in Tehran was overtaken by Muslim students, and uh, they held hostages there and, and, and a couple other locations. And this is well chronicled in the movie Argo, uh, the popular movie that won Best Picture in the book, if you actually read the book, it's even more accurately well chronicled than the movie does it. But I thought the movie, for what it's worth, um, Roland was actually very good. I enjoyed it very much. But your role um, in and prior to the whole Argo movie, there was an attempt to rescue those hostages done by the United States, which is what was called Operation Eagle Claw. So take me through um, the beginning planning of this process, because at this point in time, we don't really have the military capabilities that we have now to do like snatch and grab to go in and, you know, get high value targets the way we can do it now so easily. We didn't do that back then. Or, or if we did it, we didn't do it as well as we do do it now. So kind of take me to the beginning stages of, OK, we have these hostages. They're American hostages stuck in Tehran and we want to get them out. And what's the plan at the beginning? Okay, you got you got to go back to the Vietnam War to, to understand the, the situation. The Vietnam War basically ended in 73 to 75 period, that time period. There was a very negative feeling about the military at that time. And everything that had the word special associated with it in the military got drastically cut in emphasis and funding. So we, we basically lost all of the special operations capability we had during the Vietnam War, and we had considerable assets at, thrown at the subject. But all of, all of the airplanes were diverted to other missions, and there was very, very low emphasis on the military, especially special operations. So the embassy falls on the 4th of November, 1979. There were actually three rescue missions involved. Ross Perot had to rescue two of his people um, that worked for him in Iran. He hired, coincidentally, a retired Army colonel named Bull Simons, who had been the ground commander for the Sante raid earlier. Okay? Ah, okay. So that was one of the missions. Um, I forget the name of the book, Gathering of Eagles or something like that. But anyway, Ross Perot rescued two of his people. Then, of course, the movie Argo has to do with uh, what is called the Canadian caper, which means uh, the Canadians helped us help, uh, rescue six people that were not in the embassy when it fell and were hidden in the Canadian ambassador's residence. And um, the CIA, in a daring episode, got them out to the international airport. 
Eagle Claw was the third one, and that was the big one. What basically happened at Herbert Field is that uh, the first emphasis was a punitive option. So Herbert is the home of the gunship, the AC-130 Spectre gunship. So all of the leadership at Herbert basically was involved in the beginning option, which was to launch a punitive raid on Iran to force them to to release the hostages. I was in what is called the Combat Talon, which is an unconventional warfare C-130 that is infiltration, exfiltration, resupply of, of special operations forces. So when the embassy fell, the, the, in 12 days after the embassy fell, although they had launched assets to try to think about the, the punitive option, Carter also said start planning for a rescue option. So that's when I got involved. Now, at that time, we only had two SEAL teams, SEAL Team 1 and 2, and the Army had just developed the Delta Force. I mean, coincidentally, on the same day the embassy fell, for November 1979, was when the Delta Force was getting its final validation as the nation's counterterrorist force for this, these kinds of missions. So immediately, the, the assault force was determined to be the Delta Force. So they went to Virginia and set up a mock of the compound and started rehearsing right away. The way we got involved at Hurlwood Field was being told that um, we have to start thinking about developing tactics to go in at night, uh, develop uh, capabilities to land blacked out on night vision goggles, which we didn't have that capability at that time. We have to think about refueling helicopters on the ground. So. After about 12 days after the embassy fell, a concept had been developed in the Pentagon for two options dealing with rescue. One was if they started putting them against the wall and shooting them, we're going in with whatever capability we have to rescue the hostages. But if we have more time, we can develop a more deliberate, well-planned, well-rehearsed two-night option. And why two nights? Because... Tehran is about 1,100 miles from the Arabian Sea, where you would penetrate from the south. Helicopters don't fly very fast. Mm -hmm. So the planners immediately said, gee, there's no way we can do this in one night because we've got to use helicopters because the target is downtown Tehran. And helicopters fly so slow that we can probably do it under the cover of darkness, but it's going to take two nights. We've got to insert the force on night one, refuel it, it, get it close to Tehran. And then on night two, assuming we're still undiscovered, then we do the hit on the embassy. And so that, that was the concept that came up. they came up with. So what we have to do basically is find a refueling area in the deserts of Iran that meets certain criteria. It has to be far enough north into Iran that the helicopters, uh, once topped off, can do the rest of the mission. But it cannot be so far north that if the fuel doesn't get there for some reason, then they, they, they're too far away. They can't return to the carrier. So it would be a carrier launched uh, mission where helicopters that whose presence you could explain away on a carrier would be used. Let's just take the Army Chinook helicopter. The blades don't fold. You can't put them below decks in the carrier and their presence would be a dead giveaway because the Russians used to always follow the carrier task force at that time with, with trawlers. So you had to have a helicopter that that, that had a, a reason to be on a carrier. So they chose a minesweeper, the RH-53D. Um, big airplane, had folding blades, could be put below decks, and his presence on a carrier would not raise too many eyebrows. So they... they they were in Norfolk, Virginia at the time, so they broke them down, put them in C-5s, flew them to Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean, and then eventually they, they got put on the Nimitz. So that was a long lead time thing. It took a long time to do that. So when Carter first said we may do a rescue mission, that had to be put in motion. So it did. So we had similar airplanes back in the States to rehearse with. So the whole the whole point of the mission was two nights, as I said. Night one would be C-130s would haul fuel in large bladders in the back of the airplane and 
land somewhere in the deserts of Iran. The site was called Desert One, and we would secure the site with rangers and do it all clandestinely at night, flying low level. And the helicopters would launch from the carrier and rendezvous with us. We would refuel the helicopters. The Delta Force would come in on my airplane, um, and well, it was 6130, so there would be three hauling ranges in Delta and three with fuel. So the Delta Force would come in on the 130s, transfer to the helicopters during the refueling. And in that environment, you don't shut, dare shut an engine down. So it was very noisy, very dusty, high noise environment, very confusing to work in. So once you get the Delta Force in the helicopters and they refuel, then they head north to a, a, a hide site in a valley about 35 miles from from Hano, from uh, to yeah, Rain. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and camouflage netting would be put over the helicopters uh, during the day between night one and night two so they wouldn't be discovered by airplane flying over. And then the C-130s that, that landed in the desert and refueled the helicopters would go back. And the, the place we took off from was an island off the coast of Oman called Masira, M-A-S-I-R-A-H, Masira Island. So we would come back to Masira, and then we had ferry crews that would fly the airplanes, and we'd be sleeping in the back if we could, and around to uh, Egypt, where we had first started out from. And then on night two, assuming that the NSA and all the other powers to be monitor the fact that we were not discovered on night one, then night two is, is to be done as follows. Um, the Delta Force had inserted um, a person named Dick Meadows. He's very legendary special ops guy at Fort Bragg. In fact, there's a statue of Dick Meadows uh, at Fort Bragg. He was such a legendary uh, special forces person from Vietnam. He had retired, and the Delta Force got him back on service, uh, sent him to CIA, taught him how to dress, what to put in his pocket, sort of like um, the episode in Argo where the guys go right through the airport. Well, he did that. In other words, he infiltrated as a Welch businessman into um, Tehran, went to the Sheridan, and then there were some recruits in the military of the United States that were of Iranian extraction, spoke the language Farsi, so they were recruited to also penetrate with him, to be with him, to help him. He went out and uh, bought a warehouse, bought a bunch of trucks, big 18-wheelers, and that's how the Delta Force was going to get from the Hyde site to the vicinity of the embassy on night two, which never came about, of course. So at about 11 o'clock at night on night two, the Delta Force, three squadrons, would then um, do the hit on the embassy. One squadron would take care of the uh, the guards. One would do act the actual room clearing in the, in the building that they were programmed to be in, the chancery. And the third Delta squadron was going to secure a soccer stadium that was across the street from the embassy. And um, once everything was secured, the hostages were, were rescued. Then the helicopters would be called in to land two at a time in the soccer stadium. And by this time, by this time, the same guys, my squadron and another squadron of C-130, uh, would have seized an airfield about 35 miles from Viet, from um, Tehran, called Manzaria, and we would have seized the airfield with Rangers, and the helicopters would then fly from the soccer stadium with the hostages and the Delta Force, and land at the airfield we would have seized and everybody gets transloaded into the C-130s and by this time we have air superiority with gunships over Iran so we would have used two C-141 large transports configured for air evacuation and that's the airplanes that would have landed on the airfield seizure at, at the tail end and uh, that's the airplanes that would have taken out the hostages and the Delta Force and the helicopter pilots and the helicopters would have been abandoned on right at the airfield and hopefully we get out of dodge before the sun comes up and that was that was the two night mission we only got as far as night one because we had an accident and an abort condition at the refueling site the criteria was we had to have six operational helicopters that would leave the refueling site on night one um, fully in commission with the delta force on board and eight took off from the Nimitz, but three of them had mechanical problems en route. 
So we, we had one few, one too few helicopters refueled and ready to go. So the mission was aborted. But during the abort, there was an effort to try to save the remaining helicopters. And in the high noise, high dust environment, one of the helicopters took off and kicked up a whole bunch of dust and just lost it and crashed right into the one, one of the C-130s. And the Delta Force was in the airplane, so very disciplined people. They got out of the airplane okay. But we did lose five C-130 aircrew members and three from the helicopter. So we had eight fatalities um, on that mission. And that basically is a summary of Eagle Claw. Okay, there's like so much there. Uh, when when you are going through this, it, it, is at any point in time did you feel uneasy with the plan, or did the plan look like it was going to go off? You know, obviously no plan goes exactly the way, but did you feel confident? Well, the, the forces involved in Eagle Claw had varying levels of of, of preparedness and expertise to do the mission they were assigned to. The Delta Force, that's exactly what they were trained to do. So their part of the mission would have been a piece of cake had we been able to get them to the embassy. Um, the Iranians started with 63 people in the embassy and they released 12 and we're, they were down to 52 by the time we, we flew the mission. So the, the 12 that were released provided a lot of intelligence as to what what the situation was in the embassy. So the Delta Force knew what to expect, for instance, which way the doorknobs turned and where the hostages might be and all that. And the Delta Force, of course, is trained like any other counterterrorist force uh, of the French or the Germans or the, uh, the Brits. Well, sir, let me ask you a question real quick because I'm uh, sorry to cut you off, but I'm just curious. Like, did you feel like there were too many moving parts? Like, you know, the, the, there was the first time landing in the in the night vision and all these other things. Like, was that the right time to be trying out all these first time things? Was there too many moving parts for this whole thing to be successful? All we commission studied. That we we all we gave them demonstrations of our capability. We they, they interviewed us, whatever, and they they concluded that that was the mission. That was the, the the scenario to accomplish the mission that had the best chance of success. Had we gotten past the refueling operation in the desert, most of us feel the rest of the mission would have been a piece of cake. Now, what, what basically what basically happened with the Holloway Commission is they they concluded yes, the mission could have succeeded had had two things not happened. One thing was unforecast dust. There was probably a thunderstorm a few days earlier, and it kicked up a lot of dust in Iran, and it reduced the visibility for the helicopters. So although there were mechanical problems, had it had been a clear night, the helicopters probably could have, could have pressed on. So two things happened to, 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 to doom the mission. Number one, me mechanical problems that could have been overcome had that been the only problem. But the dust complicated the matter. So therefore, the combination of having unsuspected or unforecast dust that reduced their visibility and their mechanical problems, the two things put together is what doomed the mission. But the Holloway Commission also said these forces got together and they trained and they came up with a tremendous capability with a national issue at stake. We need to have forces that are always prepared to do this kind of stuff. We can't ad hoc it again next time this happens. So they recommended the formation of something called JSOC, the Joint Special Ops Command, mm -hmm. yeah. which, which I went to as a founding member after the mission. I was the first chief of our operations. And, of course, JSOC is the organization that was in the shadows for 25 years and then only after the Somali pirates missions and Osama bin Laden take down and all that has JSOC been exposed, basically. But it's at Fort Bragg, and it's the organization that was formed as a result of the failure of the, of the Eagle Claw. We've talked to a lot of special ops guys, both SEALs and Green Berets and things of that nature on the podcast. And they're always very kind of squirmish about giving away certain details, which I can understand. You know, I mean... The community, and I've been fortunate enough to deploy with the special operations folks, and, and I know a little bit about the, the lifestyle in the community and, and what they do, and I understand why they are very squirmish about giving away details. 
in your opinion, because we are so media driven and so media focused nowadays, and JSOC is a is a thing that people know commonly about, is that a detriment to our military and our security? Yes, I was quite upset with all the publicity that uh, came out of uh, SEAL Team Six. Special operators are trained and 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 conditioned to be what is called quiet professionals. And the only satisfaction you 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 need is to know that you were given a mission and that you succeeded or you did your best. If you failed, it was not because you didn't try hard. And you don't need a ticket day parade. You just need to go back and, and look at what you did and improve the next time. And I was quite quite embarrassed by how much SEAL Team 6 came out and and did a lot of interviews and books and that kind of stuff. That, that you, you won't find that too much in the Air Force or the Army Delta Force, but SEAL Team 6, I think, that, that was a problem I, I, was, I had a problem with, what they did. Is there any way to rectify the fact that people know what they know now about the special operations community? No, I don't think so. Um, I think the tremendous successes that we've had recently. I mean, look at look at the the snipers taking down the 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 guys on that uh, Mersk, Alabama. Captain, Captain Phillips. Phillips. Yeah, yeah. Look at the success of that thing. <laughs> I mean, a simultaneous three shot barrage from snipers taking out three guys and leaving Captain Phillips unharmed in a small ship like small rescue vessel that they were in i mean the point is that that has to serve as a deterrent so that there is some good to maybe publicity coming out but the ethos of special operations is that we're supposed to be quiet professionals and blend into the woodwork and let any kind of attention be focused on people we rescue and not the rescuers well, and I think the one thing, at least I take solace in it, uh, and even though there aren't high-profile missions that people are hearing about on a daily basis anymore, that community and those guys are still operating doing high-profile missions that no one is talking about. They are doing counterinsurgency. They are doing foreign internal defense. They are camouflaging themselves essentially in bad guy territory to try and bring information back so we can use it to our benefit, correct? That's correct, yes. In other words, you'd be you'd be flabbergasted by how many missions yeah. they, are, they actually accomplish. <laughs> Only the big ones come out in the news, but they do that kind of stuff nightly. When you look back on what you were helped to create with JSOC and, and the Joint Special Operations Community, what is your kind of big takeaway or your lasting memory, if you will? My lasting memory has to do with... Um, the fact that we were given a mission that um, we didn't have all the the bells and whistles to accomplish the mission, but it created it created an environment that let us go out and try and develop tactics that in peace, normal peacetime we never would have been able to develop. And we had carte blanche to go ahead and let me just give you an example. The Air Force had, had been pressured by the Army back in the uh, mid 70s to uh, come up with a black dot capability, use night vision goggles, and be able to insert Army forces at night in a total black dot environment. The Air Force did a test with night vision goggles and said, no, it's too dangerous, we can't do it. Then Eagle Call comes along, and our Joint Task Force commander, Army General Vaught, said, I don't care what the test report does or what it says. Just go ahead and do it. So my guys just started experimenting on how to, and this was the very first generation night vision goggles, how to, how to come down final approach in a blacked out environment, no lights anywhere, no, land, no landing lights to help you land, find the runway, and do a, do a landing and insert ranges or whatever. And we, we perfected that capability, and that's just one of the ones we perfected. We had other options that we were told to develop in response to the Iranian crisis that are still classified to this day. Um, 
let me just give you another example. The, the night vision goggles we have today are so good that you avoid a moonlight night. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in other words, you, any sort of bright you, light you, kills it. Yeah. You you go in on the darkest night possible. Thirty-five years ago, we had to use the moonlight to help us eliminate what light we had or magnify what light we had to use night vision goggles. So they've gotten so good now. But the point is, with the primitive stuff we had to operate, that's that's my l- lingering feel-good attitude about the mission is that we had this laboratory of five and a half months between the embassy falling and when we went into Iran. And then, of course, I was involved with the, the – the second effort to try to rescue the hostages, which never went, because the Iranians now were smart enough to start moving the hostages, but we still had a project called Honey Badger, where we threw all the Air Force, all the assets of the Army and the Air Force uh, at the problem to, to get ready for a second attempt. And then the third phase was early JSOC, and I was, I was involved in all three since I was the first chief of air ops of JSOC. And the, in, the advances in our capability to do missions of special ops nature at night in black dot conditions from 4 November 1979 until JSOC was well in its second or third year was phenomenal. In other words, we Grenada, the Grenada mission succeeded because of all the failures and hard work we had in the prior years. The Grenada mission where we rescued the American students on the island of the Grenada in 1983 was actually JSOC's first mission. And just a, a typical thing. What happens if you want to seize an airfield and for some reason the bad guys know you're coming and they block it with a bulldozer or something? You know, what are you going to do? So you have to have a contingency plan coming down final approach to discover that and instead of air landing, reconfiguring the air to airdrop airdrop paratroopers because you can't land because the airfield is blocked. Well, guess what they had to do on Grenada? In other words, because we had realized that ahead of time, practiced it, had the contingency plan when the Grenada mission came along, that's exactly what they had to do. They had to reconfigure and airdrop instead of air landing to seize the airfield. So the hard work we did getting ready for um, Eagle Claw Getting ready for a second attempt and early JSOC just was a, a tremendous ramp up in capability. That um, that's probably my, my my best feelings about the whole episode. Are you surprised at how good we are today at what we do? Like, given how far we've come in a relatively short amount of time. I mean, in, in the grand scheme of things, you know, look at the weaponry we've developed over the course of a hundred plus years for our military. But as far as JSOC yeah. is concerned, in relatively four decades, how good we've gotten. And yes, and uh, what you have to also understand is, had had we had we succeeded in Eagle Claw, okay, and gotten the hostages back, then Congress and everybody else would have said, "Gee, everything's okay, you know, hunky dory. You don't need an embassy. You don't need you don't need more money. Keep doing what you're doing." But the combination of the failure of Eagle Claw and the accident, the two things together, okay had a very synergistic effect that it shocked Congress, it shocked the Pentagon and said, gee, we're spending all these billions on fighters and bombers, and it's highly possible that these little dirty wars uh, with militant Islam is going to be the thing of the future. And it was very prophetic. And the point I want to make is that we, we got to where we are today much faster because Eagle Claw failed. I mean, it certainly is lucid and, and well said. I mean, I, I don't know how to thank you just simply because when I, when you tell this story, I think our military isn't what it is today without you and, and guys in your you know capacity to help develop uh, JSOC and, and the special operations community. I mean, we're, we're we don't catch bin Laden and, you know, we don't have a lot of these other things go on, as you mentioned, that without this whole thing happening and you were at the very birth of it. And that's just to me, that's beyond impressive. I can't thank you enough. Yeah, well, you know, one one other point I want to make is when the embassy fell in, in, in Tehran, the highest advocate for special operations was an Army colonel in the Pentagon. Now it's four-star general, okay? Now, 
special ops has its own funding line. In the old days, the money went to the services, and they would divert it away from special ops. <laughs> but, but now, with, with SOCOM, Special Ops Command at Tampa, and JSOC as their fighting force at Fort Bragg, it's a four-star command now, and all the emphasis there, it, it's, it's a line item on the budget for special ops. And all I can say is it's, it's the most heavily tasked part of the military today with all the little wars we have going on in Yemen and Somalia and all those places. And, and uh, it's, it's here to stay. And well worth every penny. Well worth every single penny. And one final thing. The best book on the Iran hostage rescue mission is called The Guts to Try. And let me explain how that title came about. Uh, we, we all gathered in Egypt when we got ready to deploy. Now, deploying a force like that is, is a challenge. During the Vietnam War, you had airplanes going everywhere. So when you had to move airplanes for like the Sante Raid, then uh, you could mail C-130s and helicopters into all the traffic in Vietnam. When you get ready to do a mission like Eagle Claw in peacetime, how do you train the force in the States, rehearse them, and then move them halfway around the world to Egypt and then on to Oman without raising some eyebrows? So we were successful in doing that. So we got everybody to Egypt, and then those that were going to fly night one went around Saudi Arabia over water and ended up in Oman. The control tower in Oman was operated by two British contract workers. So they saw this ragtag group of C-130s come in, set up a tent city, um, and then on the night of tw April 24th, 1980, um, Six C-130s take off at about dusk, and then about eight or nine hours later, five return. So they started listening to BBC and Voice of America, and President Carter came on the air and explained that we had tried to rescue the hostages, we had failed and all that. So they put two and two together and said, well, this ragtag group is the ones who just went in that, that last night and came back with one less airplane. So in the heat of day in Oman, they got two cases of cold beer and put them in a pickup truck and drove them around to our tent city, dropped them off. And one of the Brit guys writ, wrote on the, on the cardboard tab of the case of beer, from us all to you all for having the guts to try. So that's where the, the title of the book, the best book on the mission, came from, The Guts to Try. That's amazing. Air Force retired Colonel Roland Guidry, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your service and your patriotism, sir. We certainly appreciate it. You bet. Take care. You've been listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno and produced by Matt Pascarella. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at hazardgroundpodcast at gmail.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.